We last year, uh, you know, we were investing so heavily into the future. And then investors told us that like, no, they want to see profit now. And so we had to change, uh, you know, change the direction of the business. And we had to take some really tough decisions. But we turned, you know, around from, I mean, I think our worst month, we posted a negative EBITDA of uh, $150 million. And now uh, this quarter, we actually post uh, about a 10 million dollar a uh, little bit more of uh, profit uh, only 12 months later right so i think it's uh, it's quite uh, quite I'm, I'm really happy about these results how did you do it what were those tough decisions that you took to meet those investor demands or that pressure you were feeling from investors to turn a profit sooner well, unfortunately, obviously, part of it was uh, the fact that we had to realize that we couldn't support as much investments into the future as we were doing. So that unfortunately uh, had, you know, forced us to um, uh, to ask some of our colleagues, uh, amazing people to leave. But fortunately, you know, thanks to the fact that Klarna has such a strong reputation, we know that within six weeks, 85% of them had new jobs. So um, that feels obviously a little, a little bit at least uh, comforting from that perspective. Uh, but that was actually only like 20, 30% of the changes. The major things here has been to really move the focus from uh, you know, grow, grow, grow at all costs to being much more focused on, uh, you know, cost reduction, efficiency, and so forth. And the rest, uh, 70% has really come from that. And the majority has come from turning around the US from being loss making on a gross level to actually being uh, profitable now four quarters in a row while it's still growing very, very, very fast. And so actually, it's kind of odd, but to some degree, we had to make sure that we would like grow ourselves into a profit in the US and that would turn around the gross profit for the whole business. One of the figures that really stuck out to me looking at the Q3 report that you published is that your credit losses have actually come down in the third quarter by about 46% year on year. And this is uh, somewhat surprising or counterintuitive given that we know inflation in particular has really strained customers in so many of your markets. So how have you managed to bring credit losses down in this macro environment? Well, I think there are two things at play. Like one of the things that is often misunderstood about buy now, pay later is people think that this is a product used by people who, you know, desperately need credit or or are, you know, uh, uneducated in, in the, and I would say it's the exact opposite. This is a credit product that doesn't offer revolving. It doesn't charge interest rates. It's interest free. It's fixed installments. And so actually these are people using our products are the ones that are tired of the credit card industry's dirty tactics on like pushing a limit in your face, trying to get you to revolve. I mean, the average credit on a card is a thousand pounds, while on Klan it's 150, right? And we do not charge any interest uh, on that. So the point is that like this actually attracts a very conscious consumer that wants to use debit primarily, but occasionally would like to use credit. And you see that in the losses being 30, 40% below average industry standards. And you also see it in the sense that like in, in tougher times like this, it becomes even more apparent that these are very conscious customers that have taken these credit products. But in addition to that, I would also say, obviously, the fact is that uh, we in a lot of our new markets are seeing less new customers. Uh, the, the new customers are a smaller proportion of our total volume than a year ago, uh, which is partly just because we've become so large now in the US and UK and other markets. So the proportion of returning customers higher and obviously also underwriting returning customers is easier than underwriting new customers. Sebastian, you made a head headlines this week with the news uh, around the new legal entity that you've set up in the UK. Can you give us an update on your listing plans? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I, look, it is unfortunately a little bit boring because it is mostly an administrative change in the sense, uh, but it's also to me a sentiment to the fact that London and uh, UK is still the very you know hub of financial industry in our opinion. And to us, when we realized that as a preparation, as a first step, as a preparation for an IPO, we needed to restructure uh, the legal setup of Klarna. It, the question was raised: Where should the kind of you know top uh, top co of the company be? And it turned out that UK still is a very favorable position for that. And again, the UK listing has not been taken out of uh, consideration still, but there's no decisions made on these topics where else would you be considering i think obviously i mean the, the the truth still is obviously that in the u.s there is a, a you know a very large pool of investors with a very good understanding of uh, fintech and so forth right so that that would obviously be and you also have to remember that by now you know u.s is our largest market by revenue 
uh, and it's you know it's it's growing at a massive pace. So uh, obviously that would play in, and, and we haven't ruled out Stockholm either or 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 Germany, but but I think it probably leans more towards London versus uh, uh, U.S. right now. Okay, um, thank you for the color. Um, our sister channel, Sky News, has been all over this story as well. And at the weekend, reported that a share sale could take place within months, and we could see a valuation of more than fifteen billion dollars. Uh, do those? That, does that timeline and that figure sound right to you? Uh, I don't know. You should ask them. <laughs> I think. Look, I mean, I've been very consistent on these questions of IPO, which is that to me, uh, Klarna was ready when we believe that financial services are going to be a global business. Retail banking is going to be a global industry, not as we've seen currently, where it's like local banks in every market. And so we want to aspire to be one of those, I think, maybe four or five major global retail bank players that will be out there in, in the future. And in order to really be able to prove that we have uh, the ability to be one of them, you know, making it in the US, not only as we now are available at more than 50 of the top 100 US e-commerce sites, but actually having, you know, over 30 million consumers in the US and being profitable in the US. These were some of the kind of, to us, uh, prerequisites uh, to consider an IPO. And those have now been met. We are a global company. We have that distribution and uh, and that uh, the, uh, um, uh, distribution of our revenues as well. So as a consequence of that, we we are pretty much right. And again, we've been a bank. We have a publicly traded bond. Uh, you know, we have a lot of that kind of regulatory uh, expectations that you would see also from a listed company is already applicable to us. We publish our quarterly earnings every year, every quarter, as you've seen. So a lot of the things are in place, but. Again, there's no fixed deadline at this point of time. We're just starting to make the preparatory steps and maybe we'll go faster, maybe we'll go a little bit slower. It's also obviously dependent on the macroeconomic uh, conditions and the stock market conditions.